hey, just so you know, this is a sponsored video by Atlas VPN. Uh, so there will be an ad for that a little later in the video. Recently, I tried to do a video where me and Jimmy Snow went over Jordan Peterson's conservative manifesto, and I wasn't too terribly happy with the results. Most of this can be attributed to the fact that we have very different styles of going over content, and I would like to have a much more thorough, in-depth look at the manifesto itself. And a lot of people in my comment section actually noted that the video itself was more insulting and less informative than it maybe ought to be. So think of this as a way for me to re-go over that video with a more thorough eye and maybe even some higher production quality. Ah, but first, before we get into anything, let's get into the fan art section. The first piece of fan art we have here today is from John666, and it says, I'm going to eat a peanut butter and sandwich with slime service. The next one we have is from Disjunctioned Quinn, and it says, A follow up to my first ever fan art on the channel, and it's a response Slime Ghost Service. 10 out of 10 Halloween model, maybe? Copic marker again. Thank you. By the way, two versions. Use whichever you prefer. Edit. Both of my boyfriends agree. Tiny Slime Service is very cute. Aww. And the final one we have here is from Newt Milk. Said apparently half of my digital art practice is now Service fan art. And I think I'm okay with that. As always, everyone, thank you for your fan art. I really do appreciate it. And if you haven't already submitted any fan art, then the best way to do so is to drop it into the fan art section of the Discord. Also, if you have not already, please consider hitting the subscribe button and even hitting the bell notification icon. That helps the channel out greatly. And also, if you haven't already, please consider checking out the channel's Patreon, as that is literally the bread and butter of what allows me to make content. All right, enough stalling. Let's get right into the actual video. Hello, everyone. I'm going to read to you today something I've been working on, well, for many decades, I would say, really, but more intensely and specifically in the last four months. I've reviewed it with a lot of people around the world. I, it's called a conservative manifesto, and it's an attempt to begin the process of outlining a positive vision for the future on the center-right and classic liberal front. I decided to entitle it a conservative manifesto. I played with the title something approximating a manifesto of canonical Western virtues, but I felt that was a weaker title, and I also felt that it was time to make a statement on the metaphysical level, let's say, on the center conservative side. Conservatives are very concerned with tradition and community and responsibility, and those are all virtues and values that have been under tremendous pressure in recent years. All right, let's go ahead and get a couple things out of the way here. This is Jordan Peterson, somebody who's denoted himself to not be on the right or the left, and yet all of his opinions and everything that he does tends to always favor people on the right. He's also known as a bit of a self-help guru, so I actually completely understand if somebody comes into my comment section while I'm doing this video and says, Hey, you can't make fun of Jordan Peterson. He helped me. He saved my life. And, you know, I, I, I get it. I wholly understand if you want to attribute your own self-help journey to the advice given by one Jordan Peterson. I, I, I get it, I understand, but I also understand that as a human being, it's probably important to notice that the people who you like and look up to are multifaceted human beings and have a variety of opinions. Some of those opinions may have been very helpful to you in your personal journey, but some of those opinions may be incredibly harmful to other people. So please note, if I do throw any disparaging insults at Peterson, then they're going to be based on the things he says in the video or other things he has said in the past. On to the contents of his actual statement. During this preface, he has already made a claim that I think we need to go ahead and note, the idea that conservatism and tradition are virtues. When he mixes up the ideas of it being a ensemble of Western virtues and a manifesto about conservatism, the information has already been put on its face to everybody watching the video that he does think things like tradition are virtuous. To those versed in philosophy, you probably already know this is a bit of a fallacy. Now, granted, the appeal to tradition fallacy generally means you are saying something is true because it's traditional, and that's obviously incorrect. Believing something because other people believed in the past doesn't necessarily make something true, but I would extend that to say that 
when you try to say something is virtuous because of its place in history or because it is traditional, that in and of itself to me is equally fallacious. It's a different kind of truth statement, but it is no less still a truth statement. And so after reviewing both documents, because I, I wrote two versions, one on the canonical Western value side, I decided that the conservative manifesto title and conceptualization was stronger. Now, as I said, I'm trying to outline a positive vision for the future, and this is a very difficult thing to do. And this is a test case, I suppose, to see how people respond, because I would like people to respond well. I would like to outline a vision that's very enticing to people, that wouldn't require compulsion to implement, that would get people on board voluntarily. And so anyways, this is a, a metaphysical inquiry. And so what might that mean? You can think about levels of profundity at the base. The most profound ideas are theological, for better or worse, by definition, because they deal with what's eternal and sacred. On top of that is a metaphysical foundation, and that's where philosophy lies, and then out of that emerges such things as normative communication and social policy uh, and normative discourse. And so this is a long ways down the hierarchy towards the foundation, but it's time for a discussion of foundational principles. Part of the culture war that's raging around us is, in fact, an argument about cultural fundamentals. And so, well, I'm going to read this. Now, it's long and it's difficult, and I have to read it because it's pushing the limits of my cognitive ability, and I had to write it. I can't do it spontaneously. It's too complex. And so I hope you'll bear with me and you'll find it useful. I suspect it will require several listenings for people who are really committed to it. There's a couple things we need to go ahead and address before we get into the meat of the video itself. The first thing is, if you notice, Dr. Peterson is trying to say that it was very difficult for him to envision a positive way to spin conservatism in this particular manifesto. Uh, there's a bit that I'm leaving out just for speed's sake, where he mentions that the entire reason he even called it the conservative manifesto was to make it a play on words for the communist manifesto. That part's not super important, but I did think it's important to mention it still. But why would it be so hard to have a framing about conservatism that is positive? Well, in my view, one of the main reasons that it would be difficult is because conservatism largely isn't. The idea about conservatism, the idea of hierarchies and trying to make sure that you are maintaining the status quo, maintaining what came before, it almost always involves some level of forcing people to conform, some kind of negativity or some type of shame in order to keep it going. The biggest question to ask yourself if you are a conservative is what are you trying to conserve? What in society do you think is so hard hunky-dory and so wonderful that it needs no change, it needs no progress, that progressivism has no place in its particular space. He also gets another bit that I think is actually incredibly wrong here. He says that the foundation for all society, uh, metaphysically, metacontextually, generally is theology, and then after that you have philosophy, and then after that, so on and so forth. I actually disagree with this, because, well, as somebody who's an atheist, I, I don't see any need for religion to be a part of anyone's particular life. If you want it to be, that's your own business, but I don't see it even as society exists on the whole as a necessary part of its founding. I don't see why philosophy can't be its own foundation in and of itself. And honestly, trying to put religiosity, which is its own form of philosophical thought and philosophy itself, on two different planes it feels to be a bit of a weird grouping error to me. To me, there is no difference between the two. You use philosophy to either create apologetics for various religions or in order to contextualize religion itself, and religion itself can be viewed as its own type of philosophy with its own internal and external critiquing mechanisms. However, by framing it this way, it makes it seem like we as a society necessarily need some type of religious story some type of theological backing, or society all falls apart. Whenever you start saying that that is the foundation behind everything, then you make it seem as if that foundation can never be removed. I'm of the opinion that we can get to a point where theology and religion themselves may not necessarily be major parts of societal infrastructure anymore. Would they still be parts of people's everyday lives? Sure, absolutely. But being woven so tightly into the fabric of how everybody sees reality and how we treat each other, I would like that to be something that is thoroughly diminished, and I don't see a reason why it can't be. I don't see a need to make the claim that religiosity, religion, theology, things like this are necessarily 
foundational principles to Western society, or even society in general. To claim that they are foundational is to claim that they cannot be removed without thoroughly destroying that society. A conservative manifesto. Introduction. A profound crisis of meaning currently afflicts, destabilizes, and demoralizes the sovereign citizens of the West and the social institutions upon which we depend, that crisis has increasingly spread to the remainder of the world's people, generating confusion and sowing distrust. So the first thing I get is that this uh, beginning definitely does seem like it's trying to use the same type of language the Communist Manifesto did, but at the same time, it's very obviously Jordan Peterson's language. The second most notable bit is he very carefully uses the term sovereign citizens. Now, I don't know if he's specifically trying to grab that crowd, but I do know that Jordan Peterson is a clinical psychologist, and I also know that he's got a very, very good track record of grabbing people's attention with his words and with his rhetoric. Any word that he uses is incredibly deliberate, so I would have to go ahead and say that him using the term sovereign citizens specifically uh, is meant to signal to that crowd. Also likely not a mistake that the very first thing he's talking about is mistrust in institutions or mistrust in government right after immediately using the very deliberate term sovereign citizen. But which particular institutions are being distrusted? What distrust is being sown amongst the people who are supposed to be trusting them? We know obviously government is one, but I would imagine that uh, the sciences are also one of these institutions, given how Jordan Peterson has argued against social sciences, for instance, or, you know, our current understanding of biology, whether it be conversations about masks or conversations about trans people. I would imagine that there's any number of people who listen to Jordan Peterson on the regular and have a great distrust for institutions that give us, you know, conversations about epidemiology that they don't necessarily want to hear or conversations about the validity of trans people that they don't necessarily want to hear. So uh, I, maybe I'm nitpicking this point too much, but starting off with the distrust of institutions, uh, it, it feels like this is, again, a very, very deliberate first step here. People who generally listen to people like Ben Shapiro or Matt Walsh are going to immediately hear this and go, yeah, I don't trust government institutions either. And you know what? I don't myself, but that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to find myself on the same political side as Peterson. Producing a counterproductive discord in place of the peaceful voluntary cooperation and competition that could instead reign over and unite us. That crisis is in the first place, the consequence of a corrosive doubt sowed, not least, by the careless intellect regarding the value of the principles of value, aim and action that have heretofore inspired, guided and stabilized us. That crisis is in the second place, the consequence of the historically unprecedented realization of our ignorance about the ultimate source, nature and reality of those principles and our resultant inability to formulate and communicate a clear moral justification for their existence. So we go from mistrust of institutions to immediately talking about how people freak out when they don't have the ability to ascertain where morality comes from, where our principles should come from. This is kind of the normal shtick that Peterson gets into about uh, the idea of order versus chaos. Where do we find order and where is that order uh, best ascertained versus chaos? Uh, how do we make a society stop from slipping into uh, complete nutter nuttery? Though it seems in Jordan Peterson's estimation, uh, not only does us not knowing where things like morality and justifications for actions come from, uh, not only is that an issue in and of itself, but apparently Currently, uh, in our ignorance of where those things come from, that in and of itself causes destabilization. I can kind of agree with this, but at the same time, I don't. You see, most people go through life without knowing where morality comes from, without knowing where certain ideas and principles that they hold come from, and they operate just fine. It's not really scary to look at that particular idea of why do I think these things? Why do I do these things? Uh, why do we think one thing is moral or another? Uh, unless you actually sit down and engage with that question. I know most people largely haven't engaged with that question. And 
it can be a scary thing, but I don't think it's a thing that society as a whole is grappling with. I think it's a thing that society as a whole usually just kind of coasts on with. Most people generally don't care about the source of these things, or they have a basic idea of where they think they come from, and they're usually pretty comfortable with that in and of itself. That crisis is in the third place, the consequence of the presumptuous, premature, and finally narrowly self-serving insistence arising from that doubt and ignorance, that nothing but the will to power, the willingness and desire to dominate and exploit, motivates all individual perceptions and actions and gives rise to and maintains all social institutions. That crisis is finally use of the frustration and resentment that necessarily arises when doubt, ignorance, and intellectual pride combine to demonize, divide, and exploit, to insist upon an impossible and final conceptual certitude, and to demand recognition of a false and unearned moral virtue. That crisis manifests itself in the idolatrous battles, simultaneously petty and terrible, that currently divide our world. So here we have Jordan using very obviously religious language. Nobody really uses the term idolatry outside of its religious sense. After all, what is idolatry but worshipping an idol? And what use is the term worship outside of anime waifu thighs and or gods, unless those are the same thing to you? Jordan also is seemingly explaining to us that if you've got a world where people don't have these particular virtues he thinks they should have and don't know where they come from and find themselves in a moral panic because of this, they find themselves necessarily leaning into the idea that the only thing that matters is dominance, the only thing that matters is rigorously structured hierarchy, and that institutions take advantage of that uh, to pit people against each other. This isn't exactly something that I think is necessarily untrue, though I think that the way that Jordan Peterson goes about it is that it's so wordy and it's filled with so much sophistry that it would be very hard for most people to gleam that from what he's saying. In fact, I'm struggling to do it myself because this is just how the guy communicates his ideas. I don't like it. I think it's unnecessary. I think it's big headed. Uh, it's a thing that I used to do. In fact, look at the language I used when I started my channel and look at the language I use now. I've hopefully uh, moved away from using more complicated language that's basically only function is to make me sound smart and keep certain people away from my audience who either don't have English as their first language or don't study these concepts all the time and therefore aren't familiar with the language. I think this is one of the reasons why so many people find themselves leaning into the things that Jordan Peterson says when they hear his rhetoric. So much of it is sophistic fluff that isn't necessary for the ideas he's trying to communicate, but it also makes it to where the ideas become more ambiguous and vague because they're hidden behind such dense vernacular. When someone does that, it's very easy for someone to pull their own meaning from the words you're saying as opposed to what your intention is. And there is something to be said in a self-help sense for how that can pull somebody out of a dark place, but there's also something to be said about clear and effective communication, something that I don't think Jordan Peterson's ever really been good at. In the disputes about identity that lead astray and render hopeless, in the stoking of suspicion between men and women, in the insistence that enmity must divide black, brown, and white, in the subjugation of the education that should enlighten to the ideologies that possess, in the cycle of accusation that threatens the trust upon which peace and prosperity necessarily depends, and in the panicked, anti-human, apocalyptic doomsaying that undermines the spirit of our sons and daughters. What can those of us who attempt to abide by and manifest a courageous faith in the traditional values of our past offer in such times? Not the thoughtless and instrumental appeal to cynicism and bitterness associated with the insistence that our social and political institutions are fundamentally unreliable, corrupt, and untrustworthy. Not the harsh and condemnatory exhortation or demand to accept and uphold a moral code noteworthy only for its joylessness, sterility, and tendency to forbid and damn. Okay, so that just seems like he's talking about cancel culture there. Uh, the idea that people have certain ideologies that would rather forbid certain types of speech and would condemn people. Uh, so... I guess there's a point where I need to get into a tangent real quick, a very brief one about cancel culture. There's two types of it. There's the type of cancel culture that people like Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro and Matt Walsh tend to bitch about, which is just, did they get 
taken off of Facebook that day? Did they get taken off of Twitter? Uh, did they get taken off of YouTube? Uh, that type of stuff. That type of, you know, bitter, uh, I didn't get my podium, so now I'm angry. That's not really cancel culture. Cancel culture is the idea that, you know, when you do something... Uh, the group, the mob, the populace, they hold you accountable for it in some way, shape, or form. The positives of this can be when somebody is a sexual predator and they get outed as a predator, and then communities by and large end up either abandoning them or deadening whatever power that person might have once had because they recognize the predatory nature of that person. But then there are bad versions of it where somebody says something five years ago, and despite the fact that they are now a different and changed and fundamentally better person, people will still bring up the things they've done and said and take them to task for it every single time. When somebody says something on Twitter, when somebody responds to it with a, this you, and it's a post of something they said five years ago, and they bring it up every time. And of course, your response is, well, they can just say that, hey, I've apologized for that, I've gotten better, and then move on with their life. But the problem is, is that not everybody on a place like Twitter sees every single apology from a person who has gone through that hoop, who has gone through those character moments. So you end up in the scenario where people are constantly barraging somebody with this past version of themselves. And that past version of themselves isn't the person that they are anymore. They've changed, but they are never allowed to be someone else. And there's certainly something to be said about, you know, the type of person you become when everybody is telling you that you're a monster. Why wouldn't you just be the monster after a certain point? Obviously, there's no benefit to you for not being that. I don't know if that's the type of thing Jordan Peterson's talking about or if he's talking about that, as well as that more petty, that more vacuous, that more stupid version of what people call cancel culture. It's probably both, all things considered. There's also some language here that seems to demean the idea of criticism and cynicism, uh, the lack of faith in our institutions as they exist. Think of the BLM uh, ethos, the idea that there are people in the United States that are disproportionately affected by police violence. This necessarily sows distrust in police forces. I would imagine someone like Jordan Peterson would rather people have faith in these organizations. And I don't think he understands that most people would like to have faith in their law enforcement as well. They would like to have faith in their institutions, but we necessarily do end up criticizing them all the time. I, I find myself getting like, awkwardly parallel to the things he's saying, but I know that in a conclusionary sense, I'm not going to end up on the same side as this guy. There's also a bit where he's talking about the culture war, basically, uh, where people use their identities as uh, linchpins in this. And again, there's something to be said about how much stock you put in your personal identity, but there's also the equally valid understanding that while someone's entire personality may not be that they're trans, we live in a society where if somebody is trans or somebody is black or somebody is any type of minority, if they live in a place like America, it becomes very readily known that there is something different about them. Even if as people, we are fundamentally the same, we are not so different. American culture is one and has been one for years, and this spills into other countries as well, where if you are considered the other in any way, shape, or form, you will be treated differently. If you are black in a mostly white area, if you are trans in the South, if you are atheist in pretty much anywhere here in the United States, there's going to be that level of ostracization. So what I don't think people like Jordan Peterson understand is most people don't want to exist in a world where they go up against each other because of their identity, but we do live in that world, and it's people like the people that Jordan Peterson sides with that stoke that rage, that stoke that reality. What Peterson seems to want, and what the people who he is working with at the Daily Wire seem to want, are two completely different things, and yet they find themselves allied, and I find that kind of weird. Instead, the confident and forthright transmission 
of the abandoned eternal verities to all of those who currently wander, thirst, and starve in their absence. Again, we have an example of Jordan Peterson engaging in sophistry. He's literally just saying that there are truths in tradition that people once had, and without them, some people are lost. Like that, that's what that is. You don't have to use the word verities. You, you don't You don't need to do that. But before we go much further, we should probably go ahead and thank today's video sponsor. Hey, did you know that people can see your important information right now? Your data, even all kinds of things you don't want people to see? No? Well, now you do. You should probably fix that. Probably, probably a problem you have like when you know you have a problem, you should probably do something about it, right? Well, keeping your private information safe, you can fix that problem by getting a VPN, but not just any VPN. I would like to introduce you today to Atlas VPN. They are sponsor of the channel at the moment, and they are currently the best VPN deal on the market for just $1.99 a month. With a 30-day money-back guarantee, you can stop targeted ads and malware from getting to you. You can even keep your Google searches private because an incognito tab will not be enough to hide your sins. And I think you know that deep down. You can even find better deals on airlines and hotels by masking your location. And you can even do it on unlimited devices as well. It's not just limited to your phone or your PC. But on top of that, you can even unlock content that is region locked, stuff that you can't watch normally in your country. Uh, for me personally, uh, I'd use this to go watch some Miyazaki movies because I live in the United States, but changing my location with Atlas VPN allows me to now watch Kiki's delivery service, which is normally locked behind uh, a region wall for the 17th time. Now, I, I don't have a problem. You do, because you don't have Atlas VPN right now. We can fix that by signing up today using my link in the description below. Okay? Okay, have a wonderful time. Okay, hopefully doing the Illuminati way of putting ads in the middle of the video will be a little less intrusive than normal. Humility. Humility is the opposite of the prideful authoritarian arrogance that insists upon the possession of comprehensive and final skill and knowledge. To revere humility is to accept the insufficiency of current presumption to acknowledge the value of attending to what is not yet known, to listen to, value, and attempt to truly understand the opinions of others, no matter how ill-formed. You know, I'm gonna really just be a dick here and say I wish that Jordan Peterson would listen to anything he said himself when it comes to trans people and the validity of their identities. To strive to gain further knowledge and to convince and invite instead of insisting and compelling. Humility is therefore a fundamental precondition for learning for the revivifying, meaningful engagement that learning produces, and for the maintenance and renovation of what has already been validly learned, established, and universally valued. All right, so this is another point where I have to be kind of sort of parallel to what he's saying while still being not necessarily in full agreement. The parallel comes in when I say that, yes, there actually is some validity to what he's saying here. Um, there is an idea of hostility that is thrown towards people uh, when we are talking about, say, trans people or the identities of you know various minority groups in the United States. There is an open hostility that happens within these groups when communication is attempted uh, about the experience of living as their identity. But at the same time, that hostility is usually coaxed because of multiple attempts at trying to just live as their authentic selves. So on the one hand, yeah, I kind of agree that there's a need to invite people into the conversation as opposed to vilifying them outright. At the same time, though, sometimes, especially in Peterson's case, there are things that have been done specifically to earn that ire from those groups. Liberty. Liberty is valuable, not because it enables the hedonism that heedlessly sacrifices the future and the community to the narrowly conceptualized present and the impulsive needs and wants of the individual. Liberty is valuable because it allows all free and unique people the opportunity to best confront the potential of the future, to engage in the voluntary, productive, reciprocal interactions that make peaceful, mutually sustaining social life possible. I wonder what he thinks then of things like puberty blockers and things that people use to actuate themselves, generally speaking, in society. I wonder if this manifesto itself might come and run up in direct contradiction to the things that Jordan Peterson has done in the past and has said multiple times. 
to speak the truth that redeems and renews, and to adopt the responsibility of citizenship and ethical endeavor. Liberty enables people to think authentically and without arbitrary constraints, privately and publicly. Liberty allows people to employ that unconstrained authentic thought to imagine a diverse set of possibilities, to singly and jointly assess, criticize, prioritize, and improve them, and to choose from those diverse, criticized, and improved possibilities the most evidently valuable, compelling path forward. So if you take a look at the Overton window in any major nation and then look at the way it operates here, we are much further to the right on the political spectrum by and large than most other nations. Now, why do I bring that up? Well, it's the idea that liberty is such a fundamental aspect of conservatism specifically that I want to go ahead and fight against here. I don't think that conservatism begets liberty. I think conservatism begets conformity. You are free to live as your authentic self, so long as that authentic self is a person who fits into a predetermined mold. If you're the worker, if you're the businessman, if you're the entrepreneur, we heard the part there where he said uh, ethical endeavor. That just sounds like, you know, libertarian entrepreneurship to me. Conservatism, by and large, does not yield to higher liberty. Conservatism, by and large, leads to people being constrained into tiny boxes. It's very hard for someone to live under a conservative household, generally speaking, as who they are, unless who they are fits into one of those molds that everybody is already comfortable with. And if you don't believe me, then please listen to the lived experiences of people who have grown up in heavily conservative households. If you yourself came out the other end going, oh no, everything was fine for me, then ask yourself, were you already fitting a predetermined mold? or was an exception being made for you because you are family, because society as a whole does not view you as a family. So exceptions made for you in lieu of being family are not going to be exceptions you'll experience in the real world. Autonomy. The emergent problems that constantly beset us and simultaneously offer new opportunities can only be addressed by the continual provision of equally unpredictable and variable sets of solutions. Such provision is best ensured by valuing and encouraging development of the widest possible range of productive activities and enterprises from which variation might be drawn the most appropriate solutions. All right, so we have here the capitalism apologetics now, which of course we're going to. Um, and I know that Jordan Peterson does fancy himself to be a capitalist. He is definitely against socialism, communism, most left-wing forms of economics he's not a fan of. So I have to ask the question, and you know, you can answer this in the audience if you want to as well, but which do you think is more apt to find a solution to a particular problem? A market that only looks at profit as its motive, as its incentive, or a market that looks to the needs of the people within it as its motive and its incentive. When markets are more communally owned, as in a socialist economy, um, when a need arises, when a need presents itself, democracy existing within the workplace as well as anywhere else will, in my opinion, typically lead to solutions coming forth to solve those particular problems. Whether or not there is profit incentive, societal need will dictate where the market goes more often because society as a whole is in direct control of that market. In contrast, a profit first market like we see in an unfettered capitalistic market it does not look for what society needs more often than not, because if society needs a cure to a particular disease, but there is not a lot of profit to be made in that particular cure, then the money is probably not going to flow where it needs to, because societal need is necessarily being juxtaposed to what can fit in the bottom line, what can fit in the profit margins for your quarter. Also, when you think of the widest range of solutions possible to solve any possible problem, my next question would be, well, what does capitalism as an economic system typically yield itself to? Because unfettered, capitalism, in my opinion, yields itself to monopolies. The goal of any business is to beat the other businesses. The goal of competition is to win. 
necessarily, if you end up being the only restaurant on the block, it's easier for you to charge whatever prices you want. And if you want an example in real life of this happening, I would like to point you to the Disney Corporation. I'd like to point you to the ways in which monopolies are being held by various private industries, whether it be the healthcare industry or whether it be in the media you consume. If you don't like dime a dozen movies coming out in media, then I hate to tell you, but that is an end result of monopolies taking over the things you love. Capitalism, unrestrained, yields itself to monopolies because eventually, through attrition, competition will lead to a victor in every industry. Historically, breaking up monopolies and breaking up trusts has led to more innovation and more competition than not. And yet, people still want the ability for certain businesses to dominate industries. If you dominate an industry, you don't need to innovate anymore. If you're the only person on the block selling the thing you have, why innovate on something that works? You only need to innovate when there are multiple different people in your industry that are offering a similar thing. But capital as a resource eventually congeals and conglomerates into the hands of a small few. So without the luck of having a windfall of a strong investor, you're not going to be able to bring in the next thing to beat a Walmart or a Target. Those days are kind of over. Autonomous citizens can bring the individual differences of their temperament, experience, and skill to bear on the problem of adaptation itself. Autonomous people and institutions, as widely distributed as possible, are free to vary in their response to the particularized demands of their local environments. From that variant pool, all individuals, free to communicate and assess, can derive the solutions most apt and efficiently matched to their current situations and problems. Widely distributed autonomous local activities allow for the establishment of resilient, large-scale, unified systems, optimally resistant to the rapid and dangerous spread of any given unpredictable emergent problem, optimally able to respond with timely and particularized solutions. While I want to agree with the idea that individual autonomous people will necessarily find uh, solutions to their problems better than not when left to their own devices, this kind of ignores the fact that in any given society, in any given local area, you may not have experts in particular fields available to solve problems that that society has. For instance, in a local area, you may not have an epidemiology expert, so when something is happening uh, that is harming that community, you might not have somebody in it who is able to actually respond to the problem at hand to solve the problem of the spread of a virus. Whereas if there is an institution, say the CDC, whose job it is to conglomerate all of the people who are experts in this field, solutions can be presented and passed down in a way that is much more efficient than just having the individual autonomous people uh, make up those solutions for themselves within that society. And again, this also seems to run completely counterintuitive uh, to the things that Jordan Peterson has said in the past about trans people. The idea of people's autonomy being this important is something that I really wish he would actually hold to uh, when he's engaging in these conversations with people in general. The principle of autonomy therefore enables abundant provision in relation to the necessities and luxuries of life, maximal choice regarding the manner in which that provision will occur, and diverse opportunities for meaningful, sustaining engagement in the voluntary, productive, and sustainable private and social endeavors that best produce abundance and choice. Free markets best fulfill the need for autonomy, local activity, and wide distribution. Their superiority to all other known and likely possible systems, given that fulfillment, should be unapologetically recognized and promoted by those dedicated to the canonical values of the West. So the first obvious thing that I'm going to have to say here is I don't give a crap what the canonical values of the West are. I don't have to. Uh, there's nothing that is saying that they are important in any way, shape, or form, aside from your own simping to those particular values. Secondly, uh, it should be noted that um, when he is saying free markets, I am thinking, I could be wrong, but it feels like that's him just saying capitalism. But... The thing is, is that capitalism is not the only economic system that has free markets. It's also interesting that he says, uh, and likely any future 
ideal, as if there are not other options that can lead to better outcomes. Uh, more controlled industries with the advent of, say, technology that makes it to where the idea of food scarcity just goes out the window. Can you imagine a world, a, a almost Star Trek-like world, where abundance is reached in such a way that it is unthinkable that anybody were to go hungry, but we still have the exact systems we have right now operating under the idea of scarcity. With the systems we have right now, the free market systems we use currently, the need for profit motive, the profit incentive, is the largest factor in any particular decision. So maintaining the scarcity of resources, even in the advent of technology that makes that scarcity a thing of the past, is going to be what is advocated for. We have seen time and again businesses at various stages doing what they can to protect their profit motive while harming society as a whole, while harming the planet. We've seen tobacco companies and sugar companies and the oil industry pay for bunk, quote, scientific studies showing that the things they do do not harm our planet, do not harm our populace, do not harm our society. And yet, years and years later, as NDAs fall and as the ability to research uh, becomes more widespread, we find that these companies every single time are screwing over the citizenry in order to maintain their profit motive. I think that the idea of free markets existing with no fetters is kind of a dumb one. You do want fetters on those markets, not only because restrictions breed innovation, but also because, again, any company in a completely free market where all they have to focus on is the way to get their line to go up is going to do things like create artificial scarcity. They're going to do things that harm society as a whole. Look at the NFT market as an example. There's almost no reason for the NFT market to exist as it does. And yet, profit incentive makes it to where an innovation on the blockchain technology, which has other applications outside of NFTs, ends up being utilized specifically to create artificial scarcity on the internet of all places, where we have the ability to take a copy of anything, anything at all, and just create a thousand copies of it with no problems and no fetters. That's a feature and not a bug of current day technology. And yet NFTs exist in such a way that they try to run a counter to that abundance that is available on the internet. I see unfettered free markets doing the same thing. As we gain the ability to have unlimited housing for people, you know, with the constraints of the world being what they are, as we gain the ability for fuel and energy to become more efficient and cheaper and to the point where they could even be free and overabundant, when we get to the point where food is produced to such an extreme that anybody in the world could be fed, oh wait, we're already at that point. And our current free market system is not equipped to solve world hunger because world hunger necessarily creates a buyer. I don't like this particular point from Jordan because as a socialist, I already live in a world that shouldn't have anyone starving. We don't have to solve food production. We've already solved that by and large. The only issues we have are distribution. And I don't think innovations in distribution are going to necessarily be utilized the way they should because there's not a profit incentive in that. No other systems allow for the crucial and ever-changing decisions about what is currently valuable to be made by the uncompelled choice and voluntary endeavor of the widest possible number of people. No other systems allow for the sampling and aggregation of the myriad of widely varying and particularized thoughts and decisions constituted by that free choice and voluntary endeavor. No other system therefore does or apparently can operate in the manner that makes continued adaptation to the unpredictable horizon of the future both possible and desirable. 
So this is the last point I'm going to be getting to in this video. This is going to have to be a multi-part series on my part because I want to be as thorough as possible when going through this manifesto. But I'm going to go ahead and offer my critique on this last point here. Jordan Peterson says that no other system allows for the multitude of ideas to be utilized in a way that benefits society. I disagree. And my reasoning for that is this. If 10,000 people have an idea about something that can improve the world or improve society, but only four of those people have the capital, then only the ideas of those four people matter. You can have any idea of any innovation, anything at all, and it won't matter if you don't have the money to fund that. And going and petitioning somebody to give you that money will only work if that person sees a profit motive in what you're doing, or that person sees your idea and thinks it's good. And here's the thing, as somebody who's grown up playing competitive card games, I can tell you from experience, that even people who are completely plugged into a single industry will still disagree on what makes an idea good, what makes an idea beneficial, what makes an idea profitable. In Jordan Peterson's world, you have 10,000 people and therefore 10,000 potential ideas, but the reality is that you don't have 10,000 people with 10,000 potential ideas. You have four people. And the only ideas they're going to hear are the ones that are necessarily going to appeal to either their idea of what is profitable or what is good, or the even more narrow position of things that are both. Look at how something like Shark Tank operates. You only have a handful of people on there, and there are people who are petitioning their ideas all the time. Some are great, some are awful. But those people can't actualize their ideas without capital. They need capital to do what they want. And there's other constraints to consider as well. It's not just that you need capital to start what you want to do. It's also that you might not necessarily have the time to engage in that endeavor that could improve the world or society as a whole because you're busy running on the wage slave treadmill. Think about how many things you could be doing if 40 to 60 hours of your week were not spent being plugged in constantly to your boss's time punch. There's a thousand things you could be doing. There's all kinds of self-improvement or innovations that society could use that you could engage in, and yet you're stuck working at a Walmart or a McDonald's. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's not worthwhile endeavor in those jobs or in those industries, but it further diminishes Jordan Peterson's point. People in this random group of 10,000 might not even have the time to develop these ideas to help their society because the system that you are advocating for is necessarily one where those people cannot engage in their own autonomous endeavor because they are too busy having to engage in someone else's endeavor for someone else who has capital. You may have an idea for the greatest innovation that can happen at your local Walmart, but I can guarantee you the CEO doesn't know who you are and he doesn't care. And no amount of petitioning with your bosses is going to get that idea heard by him in 99.9% .9 of scenarios. And if it does get heard by him, the likelihood that you'll be credited with that innovation is equally low. But that is enough of that for the time being. We are almost an hour into this and I'm incredibly hungry. But I did say that I wanted to go and do a more thorough review of this, so I'm going to stick to it. There's still a bunch more points he has that I'm going to have to get into, and it's going to take some time. This is probably going to end up being about a five or six part series, so we're going to go through it all video by video, and then when we're done, we will be putting it all together into one long video that people can watch as its giant... I don't know, Gone with the Wind style movie. I don't know who did that with the entirety of the Dangers of Woo series or the Discount Hoven series, but that will be the plan with this one. So consider this part one 
in an ongoing series critiquing Jordan Peterson's conservative manifesto. Let me know what you think in the comment section below, um, and hopefully this is a more substantial critique of the writings that he has engaged in lately. But let me know what you think. Definitely appreciate any feedback that you have. And if you enjoyed this, leave a like, subscribe if you haven't already. Please check out the video sponsor, Atlas VPN. It is very hard for me to get video sponsorships these days. Um, live streaming sponsorships are a bit easier, but video ones are, they are their own monster. So let me know what you think in the comment section below. Check out the sponsor, check out the links below, check out all the artists that help make this channel work. And just as always, everybody, thank you for watching and insert end of video tagline here.